Hey, it's John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and it's The Entrepreneurial You, the show for dedicated and passionate Caribbean entrepreneurs seeking daily inspiration, brought to you by author, speaker, and award-winning entrepreneur, Henneke Wakis porter You must be prepared to ignite. And this is the most important tip to protect yourself from ransomware, which is a devastating thing for a business. It can put you all the way out of business. And that is, you need to have your data backed up by a professional. If you're a smaller business with less than 30 or 40 employees, you probably need, if you don't already have, what's called a managed service provider or an MSP. And you need to hire that MSP in a way where you know exactly how they're going to back your data up. And it needs to be off network. It needs to be to a different geography, ideally. So if there is some sort of a natural disaster or a hurricane in Jamaica that you know your data is safe in a data center in Minnesota or something, and your backups need to be encrypted, and it needs to be audited once every quarter, once maybe twice a year, you need to pay your MSP to download those backups and test them to make sure that they're current, that they have all of your critical data. Hi, this is Henneko. I'm so glad you took the time to stop by today. In Jamaican parlance, walk one. Me glad to say a dial. This episode is sponsored by HennekeWatkinsporter.com as well as the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Now on HennekeWatkinsporter.com, you can visit us for blogs, resources, books, online podcast courses, podcasts, and more. If you are new to the Entrepreneur Liu podcast, be sure to check out past episodes with guests such as John Lee Dumas, Patrice Washington, Seth Godin, Richard Branson, Amy Porterfield, and a host of other game changers. We needed to raise capital, but our experience with local financial institutions was that they were cautious and slow to act, and interest rates were far too high. We had real concerns about financing our business through outside equity investors, and the possibility of interference. Could we get a fair valuation for our business? We had our own ideas about the business and its value. Should I go the traditional route of bank financing or should I try the Jamaica Stock Exchange? So we made a call and experienced transformation of our business through conversations. I'm John Mafood, CEO of Jamaican Teas and we're listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Give us a call today at 876-967-3271 to begin your transformation through conversation. We want to see your company listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And now, here's today's episode. Passwords are like underwear. Don't let people see it, change it very often, and you shouldn't share it with strangers. Chris Pirillo. Greetings, my... Peak performer, I trust that you are staying safe. Yes, um, I continue to appeal to you to uh, abide by these safety protocols um, that the COVID nineteen um, you know leaders have been telling us to do. Uh, it really helps a great deal. So please stay safe. Welcome to episode one hundred and ninety five of the Entrepreneurial You Podcast. I'm Henika Watkiss Porter. Today's episode is with Brian Gill. Brian is a computer scientist, angel investor, and entrepreneur. Brian has started or co-founded five successful companies, been a part of Successful Exit, has been successful in VC and angel fundraising on both sides of the table. He currently is chairman and CEO of Gilware, which provides emergency IT services to clients suffering from data-related disasters and offers advice and consulting to avoid corporate data disasters. And trust me, I know I know some of those. I'm looking forward to our conversation that we'll have today, which is centered on a global pandemic cyber threats and remote employees welcome welcome brian Henneke, thank you for having me absolutely no i don't know if you've ever been to jamaica have you i have well i've, I've been on a cruise ship and I, I went to the i ported for like maybe eight hours once mm-hmm. and where <laughs> do, you, do you recall was it was experience. it do you recall where 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 you um where you docked for a while kingston maybe okay all right 
Okay. Um, and you didn't you didn't get off, so I can't necessarily ask no, you about your Jamaican I, I experience. I got off the boat, but we didn't really we didn't really get the full experience. You know, it was one of those get off the boat and maybe go to a beach and hang out and get something to eat and then get back on the boat. So I, I definitely would like to get back there someday post pandemic. Yes, please. <laughs> so have you had any Jamaican food or any Jamaican experience from where you were at? Um, not, not too much. Madison does have a Jamaican restaurant that I've been to. Mm -hmm. So certainly I, I like all kinds of Caribbean cuisine, honestly, like it's so the food is colorful and bright and lively and spicy. And, um, I, I certainly enjoy it. Yeah, you're talking about food now, and, and here I am just thinking about it and just salivating. Anyways, let's get to the <laughs> matter at hand, a global pandemic, cyber threats, and remote employees. Now, before we get into the heart of that topic, which is, um, you know, it can be very, uh, you know, technologically advanced, you know, for some people who think that they're not tech savvy and you know it could be scary for them but we're going to make sure that you know we, we we keep it to a level that um it's not threatening in any way right and they're glued to wanting to hear but before we get into the belly of that how did you end up brian doing what you're doing now yeah i mean i kind of like anything um we about 20 years ago um my brother and i my younger brother tyler and i and a couple other of our friends um, that we had worked with in the past or gone to school with, uh, we knew we wanted to start some kind of a, of a technology company. And we went through a thought process and a brainstorming process that was lasted a few months. And we tried a few things and played with a few concepts. And the one that stuck was our, our the concept of data recoveries. And, you know, a while ago now, but, you know, if you had a hard drive crash and your hard drive in your computer started clicking, we would take that device, make temporary repairs to it, and then get people there, reunite them with their data. And in the earliest days, it was a lot of just consumers looking to get back their pictures of their kids and things of that nature. Um, but the business, you know, accelerated and graduated over time. And, you know, now our focus is primarily on, on assisting small businesses and large enterprises from all manners of data recovery disasters or, or data related disasters, not just, you know, a clicking hard drive or something. And, you know, what we've seen grow tremendously in the last five years is, is ransomware response and mostly, you know, some people, but again, mostly companies and some very large enterprises that, you know, everybody gets to work one day and, and everybody has a note on their monitor that says all your data has been encrypted and you have to pay us a lot of money to get your own stuff back. And it's pretty crazy. Wow. Yes. We want to touch on that a little later on. I mean, you're going into the heavy stuff. I'm like, yeah, ransom. Boom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. That's okay. Um, you said something which is I, I, I smiled as you said it uh, about reuniting people with their data because it can be such a traumatic experience losing your everything that's on your hard drive. It has happened to me and it was the most frustrating experience. I remember when it happened, Brian, I actually bought a software to, re to recover it and I recovered everything except the one thing that I specifically wanted to recover, which had led me to buy the software in the first place. I mean, so reuniting, when you put it like that, you know, tell us about that experience of you re reuniting, um, you know, data with their users. Yeah. So again, most of our users have also tried to, they bought some software or they took it to an IT professional who tried to run some software and it didn't work. You know, and often because you are you have a hardware problem, not a software problem. You know, the device itself is dead. You know, maybe you, you walked an iPhone into the, into the ocean or maybe you, you know, again, you dropped your laptop and it started clicking. Um, or you, your dog or your child yanked your external hard drive off the desk and it hit the turf. And now the device is broke, broke. And, you know, no, you could have an, Bill Gates with an army of 10,000 software engineers and they're just not going to be able to help you, right? So um, what we do is we, we evaluate those units for free. So we have our engineers figure out what's wrong with them, figure out if the recovery is going to be feasible. We give our clients a quote because just because we can do it doesn't mean it's going to make financial sense for the client, right? Um, and then 
if it does make financial sense, they approve it. And then our mechanical engineers or electrical engineers get to work. And we can, you know, about 95% of the time, we're able to make those temporary repairs to that situation to, to get people their stuff back. And there is a tremendous amount of satisfaction in, um, again, we, we mostly help businesses these days, but you know, we, we still see, a more than a couple dozen consumers every day. And, um, you know, I still get a big smile on my face of, of giving people their, you yeah, know, sometimes back. it's five, <laughs> 10 years worth of their kids' photos, you know, and, and people are just, just upset and crying and, you know, but, and, and sometimes even on the business side, there's tremendous satisfaction too, because like you literally sometimes get a chance to save somebody's business. Like, um, just last week we had a wedding photographer who went, shot a wedding and got back to the office and the little tiny camera card that had like 600 wedding photos on it and the wedding videos was dead. They plugged it into 10 different computers and no computer even noticed that anything happened. The card was dead. And this person was looking at their whole livelihood getting flushed down the toilet. You really can't get everybody back together again, get them back all into the tuxedos, right? Um, So, you know, we were able to take that little tiny card and do what we do and got it to behave and recovered all those photos, which literally, again, kept them in business in that little community. And it's pretty fun. You know, it doesn't always work out. There's a, there's a dark side to it. You know, maybe 5% of the time we can't help. Um, you know, we don't charge any money and we explain why we couldn't help. And, um, you know, failure is a part of our business and, you know, we can't, we're not in an industry where we can bat a hundred percent. It's just not in the cards. New data from Microsoft shows that it shows how really the pandemic is accelerating the digital transformation of cybersecurity, right? So among the key insights are data showing that an alarming number of businesses are still impacted by phishing scams, security budgets, um, and of course, due to hiring, increased hiring in response to COVID-19. As we navigate this very trying time, why is this happening? Why are we now, you know, at are such a risk from um, local outbreaks? And, and the local outbreaks, we're talking about, you know, the whole um, fishing and, and, and increased security risk. Why is this happening? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's a lot of different reasons. The, the main culprit is that we are, as a society, going through uh, a moment where businesses are doing an exceptional amount of remote working. You know, it's it's always been some companies here or there. Some companies have been dabbling with it. But all of a sudden, most, if not all large companies in the United States and even, you know, Jamaica, the rest of the world, are having 60%, 80% of their employees are now working out of their homes. And um, for the bad guys, the scope of opportunity has grown, you know, 500%. Um, and we had to do it in a hurry with very limited budgets and the network security has lagged where it needs to be. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and with the phishing scams in particular, you know, if you're, if your guy down the office said, Hey, you know, wire me $10,000 for X and Y and Z. If he's 12 feet away from you or eight or 50 feet away, you, you would be doing a lot of these large transactions in person. But now a, a lot of these financial movements are happening remotely and over email. And it has opened up, you know, again, a tremendous amount of the social engineering that just wouldn't have been all that easy with, with people working in the same office. Now that all these people are, are disparate and working all over the place. It, it's again kind of opened up some opportunities on the social engineering side too. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about phishing scams. Um, kind of bring us home to what that really is and, and, and how is it able to, you know, are these um, cyber attackers uh, able to effectively fool people into believing that what they're presenting is, is, is legitimate? Yeah, I mean, so the first thing to understand is there's tiers. 
And there's many people out there that have gotten, you know, they check their email box and there's some random email from, you know, somebody in Bolivia that says, you know, your uncle died and I need to wire you $13 million. And, and people are like, yeah, okay, this is a scam and they delete it. Right. And they, they become too confident that, you know, oh, I can't get burned by phishing. I'm smarter than this. Um, and they don't really realize that there are some incredibly sophisticated, very, very smart people that that can be at the other end of that email. And sometimes it's an email from somebody you know. And it reads like an email that they read. And maybe they're just going to share a document with you like they've done a million times before on a platform like Dropbox that you have used with them before and you click on the document and you log into Dropbox and then there's nothing there. And you're like, well, that was weird. But what just happened was a couple of things. First of all, that criminal didn't really send you to Dropbox. They sent you to a website that looked exactly like Dropbox and the URL was subtly different. It was DR0B0X or something instead of Dropbox spelled normal. Or maybe it was like, you know, DropboxBucket.com instead of Dropbox.com. And when you went and you entered your username and password, you just legitimately entered your username and password for Dropbox, and now they have it. And right away, they can log into your Dropbox account if it's not two-factored, and they can start downloading every piece of data that you have up there. More than that, they've got a username and password that work for you. More than that, they just got your IP address. And if you're the type of human that has one password for Dropbox, and it's pretty much the same password for a lot of the different services you use, it's the same password as your Gmail, it's the same password as, you know, your, your box.net, it's the same password as your desktop. Well, all of a sudden, you know, you've had your credentials owned. And if you're on a computer network that does not have a hardware firewall in front of it doing two-factor authentication because your boss just moved you from home from the pandemic and, you know, you're just basically plugged into the Internet from your desktop on your cable modem or DSL modem. Well, now at 6 o'clock that night, that bad guy is going to try to perform what's called an RDP attack on your, on your desktop computer, and they're going to try to log in as you. RDP, what is that? Remote Desktop Protocol. So they're going to try, so all, you know, the Windows operating system supports um, RDP, which is I can remote desktop onto a different computer in a different location. As long as I've got RDP turned on and I have credentials for that computer, I can basically log in as myself. And I do this every day. I, I have a computer in the office and I'm working from home a lot and I RDP onto my box in the office all the time. Now, I have a lot of different security handshakes to prove that I'm actually me before I get there. But not everybody does. So sometimes that email comes from somebody you know, and it looks exactly like the email from two days ago. Absolutely. And, so we have to be yeah. quite vigilant. Um, so, of course, I've mentioned phishing and we've talked about that. But that's just one of the ways that cyber threats are um, coming at us. So what are some of the other things that remotes, you know, employees working remotely need to be looking out for, keeping an eye out for? Yeah, I mean, the number one thing is is your your network. So to get onto your business network, you need a, a hardware appliance, a hardware firewall, per, you know, that is protecting that little ecosystem, right? You cannot just have your computer in your little office plugged into the Internet. So um, because... If you're bare on the internet, you can get owned a number of different ways. And I could talk for literally hours about it. But anything is, it could be as simple as Microsoft issued a security patch three months ago. And you did not take the update and perform the patch. And the reason that Microsoft was patching was because there's an exploit to the operating system, which and lets somebody... Break, let me just break here. Just tell me yeah. what patching is. Any kind of operating system, which all types of devices have operating systems. Your, uh, your, your iPhone has an iOS operating system or your Samsung phone has an Android operating system. Your computers have a Linux or a Windows or a Macintosh or an Apple operating system. And this is the code that runs that device, right? 
and they have security issues. All of them do. Nobody's ever written a perfect piece of software. Nobody's ever written a perfect operating system. Because of this, as exploits have been found, these companies will patch them, and that patch is a repair of those features. And sometimes they're adding features with a patch too, but most patches involve plugging security holes that have been found by security researchers and already exploited by bad guys. And, you know, so that annoying thing on your iPhone or your Android phone, it's like, hey, you need to patch your your operating system. Be sure to plug it in tonight, and it's going to take two hours. And people are like, ah, skip it. And I I don't have time to deal with that. I mean, or on the Windows side of things, sometimes we go in in a security assessment and we look at some of the computers and, you know, they are many years of security patches behind because they just have never run the Windows update to bring the operating system up to snuff. And um, because of that, every, you know, hundreds and hundreds of those known exploits are out there. So they don't even need to fish you to get your credentials. They've penetrated the operating system and you're running an old penetrated operating system and you could do everything right. But if you didn't patch, it didn't count. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, um, business email compromise, those, those kind of scams. So, um, how, how does that work? I mean, we know about the phishing as you, as we've been talking about, but in, in my research, it's, it's one of the things that I've come across, right? And I want us to talk a little bit, a little bit about that. Business email compromise scams. And I'm seeing that it's switching um, to online gift cards and, and people are, you know, scamming you and um, getting gift cards and all of these things. How, how does that work? And um, yeah. Well, yeah. And that, that, again, that's the gift card scams. You know, that is again, the lowest end of the totem pole, right? That That's the entry level bad guys, the the stuff that, you know, most people can sniff out. But there, there's a number of different flavors of, of email scams. But again, they're more sophisticated than people often give them credit for. So what can happen sometimes is, and it, again, all this stuff is interrelated. So maybe you have a bad username and password for your for your Gmail and you do a lot of business off of your Gmail. Or may, again, maybe you have the same password as your Hotmail account or your, your password is bad or, or owned in some way. You know, sometimes the bad guy is going to log on to your email and they're not going to do anything. They're going to log on to your email and they're going to read it. And then they're going to set up forwarding rules where if any email has the word you know, wire transfer or bank or finance or any of these other sensitive keywords, if any of those keywords are in the email, forward it to me. And now they think, oh, this is interesting because, you know, Henneke is sourcing, you know, $5,000 of some product she needs for her business to, to make money to sell product. She's got some vendor that she needs to send money to. And she's communicating with that vendor. But all of a sudden, the bad guys will hijack that conversation. And you'll get an email that looks like it's from your vendor again. It's very similar. And it's about the, con- it's about the thing that you were just talking about. And, you know, you needed to, to buy $5,000 worth of textiles or whatever it is. And then they'll say, okay, you know, wire the money over here. Send the check over here. And then a couple weeks will go by and you won't get your product. And you'll reach out and say, geez, I was supposed to receive this by now. And they'll say, oh, don't worry, it's coming. You know, we've had some backups. COVID's caused some problems. Hang tight. And then multiple weeks later go by, and of course, you still have not gotten your product. And it's because it was never really the vendor. I mean, it was the vendor to begin with, and then they switched gears on you. And as the vendor was emailing you saying, hey, Henneke, did you still want that product? They replied from you saying, no, we're good. So again, sometimes these email scams are... Um, they're not always about encrypting a, a network, sometimes just penetrating a business person's email and then being patient. And I'm talking about the bad guys being patient, waiting for their opportunities, biding their time. And then they hop in and scam somebody out of sometimes many thousands of dollars. Mm. And, and well, Brian, this is like, it just sounds so scary. You perhaps don't want to use the internet, but we have to, and we must, <laughs> right? <laughs> so as we, as we know that we must, and we have to, 
what are some of the actionable tips that we can have to, um, that you can give us rather, to mitigate sure. against the security risks as we're about to wrap? Well, certainly anytime, again, anytime you're in an organization where you're spending a reasonable amount of money, especially in the, in the form of any kind of a wire transfer, you need to have verbal confirmation. And um, what I mean by that is, you know, call the bank, call the vendor, you know, call the, the number on their website and verify all this information is really them. Okay. And it may seem ridiculous, but you can explain why you're doing it and they'll get it. If it's any kind of business that's doing a lot of those types of financial transactions, they're going to fully understand why you're doing it that way. Uh, but you can never trust email for this kind of thing. Um, the second thing is, um, and this is the most important tip to protect yourself from ransomware, which is a devastating thing for a business. It can put you all the way out of business, right? Um, and that is you need to have your data backed up by a professional, by, you know, if you're a smaller business with less than 30 or 40 employees, you probably need, if you don't already have what's called a managed service provider or an MSP, and you need to hire that MSP in a way where you know exactly how they're going to back your data up. And it needs to be off network. It needs to be to a different geography, ideally. So if there is some sort of a natural disaster or a hurricane in Jamaica that you know your data is safe in a data center in Minnesota or something, and your backups need to be encrypted, and it needs to be audited once every quarter, once maybe twice a year, you need to pay your MSP to download those backups and test them to make sure that they're current, that they have all of your critical data. Um, you know, all these things cost money. But And then if you're ultra, ultra paranoid, you need to make what's called an air-gapped backup where every month you back up all your organization's data to something that you then unplug from the Internet <laughs> so that no matter how penetrated your networks get, the bad guys will not have been able to they're not going to fly to Jamaica and break into your house or break into your office, right? Because they're that's just not going to happen. So at least if you have an air-gapped backup, even if it's a bit dated, you won't have to pay somebody $100,000 to get your own stuff back. Um, and then we talked about it a lot already, but 90% of these scams can get avoided by increased user authentication. So you mentioned it in your quote to kick off the episode talking about passwords. Um, the reality is... We really need to move beyond passwords. And there are some emerging technologies, and there's a cheap little doohickey called a YubiKey Nano. You can buy them, you know, pretty much at any electronics retailer. They cost about 40 bucks, and they will do passwordless authentication for you. And if you don't have that physical dongle, you can't log in as you anywhere. And it, it's a little extreme because if you forget the dongle, and, you know, then you don't log in anywhere, right? If you lose the dongle, then you have problems. So you might want to buy two of them. But it actually makes it more efficient to log into a lot of things. And it makes it incredibly secure. It's a very, very simple thing you can do to get move beyond this whole, like, you know, this is my email address and I've got maybe three or four passwords that I use and they're all, like, the name of my cat and a number or something, like, we have to get beyond that because it's just a horrible way to do user authentication and it just doesn't really cut it here in 2020. Mm -hmm. Wow. A mouthful, Brian Gill. I want you sh at this point to share some stuff that you've shared with me before that you want to give away um, in terms of, you know, how to hire someone to upgrade their IT security and recovering um or the, the questions you want to ask before hiring a managed service provider. So share with us that information as well as how we might get in touch with you further. Yeah, so there's a free guide. It's not gated or anything. You can just Google for, you know, Gilware, you know, how to hire an MSP, or I'm hoping uh, and I will put the uh, link in the episode notes. Uh, absolutely. Um, and well, all it is, again, like most people are non-technologists. Most business owners are non-technology people right? And they know how to hire people in their realm. They know how to hire salespeople. They know how to hire people to work retail or work the floor. They know how to hire people to run various industrial equipment because that's their livelihood. They are clueless 
how to hire IT people. So they don't. And again, if you are 50 employees or less, you're not going to, there's no economy to hire a full-time IT person. So you're going to need to hire another firm, a B2B firm called a managed service provider. And if you're not careful, you're just going to pick up the yellow pages and call one and you don't know how to hire them. You don't know how to interview them. And you're, you might, maybe you'll interview two and just pick the cheapest one or something. Right. And, what we've put together is a series of questions that you can ask that MSP before you hire them that's going to give you an, a feel for how professional and how good they are, specifically at keeping your, your data safe. And we also have, of course, the answers that you want to hear in there. <laughs> so you don't... <laughs> So you can uh, kind of educate yourself on what you're shopping for. Right. And that way you hire a good MSP and again, um, and they can help you upgrade your computing equipment and keep your stealth safe from the bad guys and just safe from natural disasters or computers breaking because all these things happen. Thank you, Brian Gale. This has been my pleasure speaking with you and um, such an important topic, particularly at this moment in time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And thank you, my people performer, for tuning in to this episode with Brian Gill. I certainly look forward to connecting with you next week. In the meantime, connect with me for all things podcasting, whether my books, coaching, online courses, or just to shoot me a question. So visit hennikawatkisporter.com and send me a WhatsApp message directly from my homepage. It will come directly to my phone and I will send you a response as soon as I can. And I want to leave this week's point of hope with you. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 46 verse 10. What good 